If it's Thursday, America's post-row reality puts President Biden's power and relevancy to the test. The president speaks on the world stage under pressure to deliver at home, where the fight goes from here in just a moment. Plus, Trump's White House counsel faces a new subpoena. The January 6th committee calls Pat Cipollone to testify about the former president's actions tied to the insurrection in the wake of this week's bombshell testimony from a former White House aide. Why it matters and what it means for the investigation ahead. And later, the Supreme Court in the spotlight and under fire again. A new decision on the future of a Trump era immigration policy and now a looming decision connected to Trump's efforts to overturn state elections. Plus criticism from President Biden and an historic oath of office all in one day. messenger to carry this forward when Democrats, many of them, many presidents, want you to do it. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm the president of the United States of America. That makes me the best messenger. I'm the only president they got. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd. I'm the only president they got. That's how President Biden answered a question from my colleague Kelly O'Donnell earlier today while in Europe. Uh, Kelly asked the president about his role leading Democrats after the Supreme Court's decision on abortion. And yes, he's the only president they've got, but new polling, new reporting, and conversations I've had with plenty of Democrats around the country suggest that Biden, for good or bad, is becoming increasingly irrelevant for Democrats right now as we get closer to the midterms. What does that mean? It doesn't mean his actions are irrelevant. It just means politically. Nowhere is Biden's struggle for relevance more evident, though, than on this issue of abortion. Democratic lawmakers are urging him to take, quote, bold action on abortion rights in the wake of the Dobbs decision, even if it means losing a battle in the courts. But while the president said today he would do everything legally in his power in terms of executive action, his administration has balked at some suggestions from Democrats, including declaring a national health emergency on abortion or opening clinics on federal lands. In fact, the president punted that issue back to Congress this morning, while also urging his base to turn out in November, urging the Senate to lift the filibuster to break the logjam on codifying Roe and on other constitutional questions, something Senate Democrats don't have the votes to do. Meanwhile, new polling suggests Democrats are going to get more help politically from the abortion issue than they're going to get from Biden. Just take a look at this. Before the draft Supreme Court decision on Roe leaked, voters indicated they wanted Republicans to control Congress by a thin margin. But any number where you're up on the Republican side is a big deal, according to that April NPR Marist poll. In that same poll, President Biden had a 41 percent job rating. Fast forward to the June version of that same poll from those set of pollsters. And now voters indicate they want Democrats to control Congress by a big margin. It's a 10 point swing. But over that time, President Biden's approval rating essentially was unchanged. It moved a point, actually went down. Similar trend in the political morning consult poll. Generic ballot was tied in early May before the opinion leaked with President Biden's job approval at 44 percent. Now Dems are up three points in the generic ballot. President Biden's numbers not really budged. Bottom line, the abortion issue appears to be giving Democrats overall a bounce right now. But that same bounce does not apply to Biden. It's a warning sign for the president as his administration confronts a struggling presidency, which has also led to questions about Biden's viability in 2024, something White House aides are aggressively trying to snuff out. So joining me now, NBC News White House correspondent, chief Biden whisperer, unofficially, Mike Memoli, also with his Democratic pollster, Anna Greenberg. So Mike, I want to start with you because this issue, particularly on abortion rights, this is this, it's sort of another moment here, arguably, where Democrats are sitting there going, hey, um, why aren't you pushing the envelope on here? Or push the envelope there. And now abortion's the latest thing. Let's push the envelope more, Mr. President. Um, Mike, what's the administration say to this? And, and are they willing to do some things that maybe the courts say no to simply to show the base they're trying? Well, Chuck, if there are some in the party who are frustrated with Biden, there are also some here at the White House who are frustrated with their party. They are constantly working against the criticism that they're getting uh, from 
you know, friendly fire here at a time when they think Democrats should be locking arms and taking what was, yes, a very disappointing judicial ruling, but potentially a political gift for the party to run on, to stay on message, and to hammer that message home relentlessly through November. That's what you heard from the president today, that he is willing to do everything he believes is within his power uh, constitutionally, uh, within the executive branch, to try to defend not just abortion specifically uh, and that right, but a, the right to privacy more broadly, which has been a career-long focus for this president. Uh, but they're also saying that you can't run against, in the case of P former President Trump two years ago, as somebody who took our Constitution to the breaking point and then ask this new president, mm -hmm. President Biden, to push the envelope in yeah. the same direction. This is all about fight. But this is also a White House that feels like, listen, this is not a president who's always had the respect they feel like he deserves from his party. It was at this point in 2010, you'll remember well, Chuck, that Democrats were already yeah. talking about dumping Joe Biden from the ticket in 2012 because of President Obama's weakened political standing. And so this is sort of par for the course, but it's part of why we're hearing the president himself is increasingly frustrated and talking with political allies on the phone and saying, listen, I'm the, as he said publicly today, I should point out, I'm the president you got, and I'm still the best person who can lead this party to victory in 2024, especially if it's Donald Trump, but even if it's not him in a form of Trumpism that they think is here to stay within the Republican Party. Let me bring in Anna Greenberg. And Anna, I have, there's some more state polling. Um, there's certainly one public out there that sort of, sort of reinforces this trend that we've noticed, but it's a lot of private polling I've heard about recently, a lot of post-primary polling where you see, and post-row polling, where you see the Democratic numbers in general are ticking up. Maybe it's for a specific candidate. Biden's have it. Is this the elixir the party's been needing, this Roe decision in a perverse way, Anna? Um. I think the answer is yes, but definitely in a perverse way. I mean, this is an election that the Republicans want to be about Biden um, and then more specifically about inflation and immigration. And instead, there's a new issue uh, and it's not an issue where they have an advantage. And if anything, they're in the distinct minority. And the issue itself is pretty black and white. I mean, it's not there's there's not a lot of nuance here. Right. And, and, and the nuance, to the extent that there are some Republicans out there running who are trying to be more nuanced, is sort of erased by you know, Texas and Oklahoma and Idaho and and these these ongoing Republican primaries right. where people are moving farther and farther to the right on this. And so, you know, you not only have injected an issue into this election that's an advantage for Democrats, it's an easy issue to message on. And it's a met and, and that message is broadly appealing to anywhere from 55 to 60 percent of the voters. And I've even seen in testing the main Republican attack, I mean, mostly they're trying to avoid talking about it altogether, but to the extent that they are, that sort of Democrats support abortion up to the moment of birth, which of course is absurd, putting, posing that notion that, you know, Democrats favor, you know, abortion up until, on demand until the nine months versus Republicans supporting a ban with no exceptions for rape and incest in women's life, you actually win that 60-40, right? So I think this is a, is a big boost. I mean, I hate to say it because I sound like a hack, but it's a big boost uh, for Democrats. And I'm seeing it in the private polling that I'm doing. And not just that Democrats are doing better, but we asked this question about people's level of motivation or enthusiasm around participating. And right. there's been a gap between Democrats and Republicans. And what I'm starting to see is that gap has either is either shrinking or has has been eliminated. Now, is it does it endure? You know, is it just a reaction to what just happened? And does it last in November? That's an open question. But I certainly see a boost around interest in participating in the election among among Democrats and pro-choice voters. And what do you attribute the fact that Biden hasn't gotten the same boost? Is it simply he's not on the ballot? He's not on the ballot, um, for sure. Um, and though mm -hmm. I have to say, it has been remarkable to me. You can see it in the numbers that, that you posted that showed the, the disconnect between his approval and the generic ballot. I'm seeing that everywhere, where individual Democrats are way overperforming Biden. Um, and, and it's been true. It was true pre-Roe also. And so I think it's partly because Biden is right. on the ballot. I think part of it is that a lot of Democrats are pretty discouraged and and um, by Biden and the Biden administration, but they're still voting Democratic, right? So even if they are giving him a somewhat disapprove, yeah. they're still voting for a Democrat. I, I have a thesis that basically says in the era of polarization, we always sort of underestimate the uh, the 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 in party, if you will, meaning that. If everybody's starting at a floor of 47 percent, there's only so much movement we're going to see. Mm -hmm. Is that probably how we should be staring at the midterms, Anna? 
Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it, de it depends on state by state, right? And it's congressional district sure. by congressional district. And by the way, abortion plays out differently in these different states. It's a different issue in Georgia and Arizona than it is in California and New York. But absolutely. I mean, if you have a poll that has a Democrat getting 42 and it's in a competitive place, they're not going to get 42. They're going to get 47 right. or 48. And conversely, if Republicans at you know 43 or 44, that Republicans going to get more than that. I mean, that's people end up going going back to their their base. Mike Memoli, do, does the administration prepared for the fact that many Democrats might say, love you, uh, Mr. President, but don't visit Michigan right now. <laughs> eh, you don't have to come to Colorado. Are, are they prepared for that? Or are they going to really want to get involved in these midterms to basically shake this concept that they're not a important or the leader of the party? Well, Chuck, it's it's interesting that you mentioned Michigan because just in the last few minutes, I got a statement from uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer's office. You remember the president today said he's hosting sort of a roundtable with governors tomorrow who have been on the front lines of this abortion ruling in trying to protect uh, women's rights here. One of them at the top of the list is Governor Whitmer. And Governor Whitmer is probably, if you look back to 2018, one of those candidates Joe Biden, former vice president, campaigned with. Mm -hmm. She was welcomed into that race when a lot of other national Democrats were not. She has a scheduling conflict tomorrow and can't participate in this roundtable event tomorrow. I think that's a flashing red light. Now, I'm also told this was an event that came together mm. at a very late stage. But if this was a president with a popular uh, with popularity maybe in the 50s or 60, yeah. I think Governor Whitmer would find time on her schedule to join him tomorrow. Listen, the White House is telling me that you're going to see him ramp up his public whether you call it campaign or just mm -hmm. simply domestic advocacy travel, once he gets through this really gauntlet of summits he's had over the last two months. Uh, and yeah. those events might not, though, be with candidates. They might just be Joe Biden on the road doing a town hall meeting, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, in a key state or a key district. We have seen him, we've seen these frontline candidates willing to appear with him for infrastructure events early this year, but I think you're going to start seeing that invitation list getting smaller and smaller. But the White House wants to use this fall campaign yeah. as a test run for 2024, if not just about message, to show Democrats the other issue yeah. they're worried about, his age, that he still has the stamina and the fight to do this for another four years. Anna, what would you advise a candidate to do? I mean, I, I, I guess the, the polite thing to say is you don't want to bring Washington to your state if you don't have to. Right. Is this that is why the president might not problem, be though. a valuable? Right. I mean, yeah. but this is perennial. Did anyone want George Bush in 2006 and, to, you know, campaigning for them? Did anyone nope. want Obama in 2010? Yep. Like, this right. is always true, you know, that no one wants them to come. Yeah. Um, I would say one difference with Biden versus Obama and Trump is that the there's a lot of disappointment around Biden and feeling that he's weak and ineffectual. You don't have the hate the way you saw it with Obama and Trump. So I actually think yep. that it is, in terms of just thinking about this purely, you know, political consultant mode, I think he's less problematic going to these competitive places than Trump or, or Obama would have been, to be honest with you, because it's less about a anger and it's more about disappointment right. and being concerned about whether or not he's strong, right? That's a very That's a, different feeling towards somebody. That is a, a, a fascinating way to take it. I, I, I <laughs> totally agree with how you frame that. Mike Memoli, Anna Greenberg, really appreciate uh, both of you getting us started. And before I get off this topic, I want to bring in our senior national political reporter who happens to be based in Florida to get what is going on in Florida, where today a judge blocked Florida's new law that would ban abortion beginning tomorrow, starting at 15 weeks on the grounds of privacy. Mark, um, I, I'm, I'm assuming here this is very temporary because last I checked, it's a DeSantis state Supreme Court. Is that where this is headed? And how quickly does that happen? I can't say how quickly it happens, but Florida has a constitutional amendment which gives a right to privacy. And prior Supreme Courts in the state have held that that privacy right extends to abortion. The thing is, it's a new Supreme Court. The stare decisis with mm -hmm. conservatives is, ain't what it used to be. So there's a lot of bets being placed that this is going to be overturned and that the states now paused restrictions on abortion. It's 15 weeks, by the way is going to be unpaused. That is, this lower court ruling is going to be overturned. Mm -hmm. It is a very Republican Supreme Court. DeSantis has had three selections so far, and everyone who sits on the court now has been appointed by a Democrat. That wasn't the case, you know, five, six years ago. You mean by a Republican? 
Sorry, Pardon I mean me. by a Republican. Yeah. So all seven uh, on that. I remember what made the last governor's race so important is that literally on day one, the new governor was going to have three picks. Is that right? It's not only the case, but Ron DeSantis crusaded that way. He said, look, the, the next governor is going to have three picks. And he was unabashedly yeah. uh, pro, or better said, uh, anti-abortion. Sorry, I'm kind of muttering my words these days. It's a little hot here in Florida. Don't worry. But so we're, we're all kind of strapped in and waiting for this to happen. It's, it's a great example, kind of more broadly, of Ron DeSantis just kind of getting everything his way, whether it's out of the Florida legislature or out of the courts. And right. he's just become sort of a juggernaut, uh, the power of which we haven't seen in a Florida governor in a long time, if ever. Yeah, probably not since Ruben asked you, and that's really, honestly, before your and my time. Very quickly, Mark, you heard our conversation about sort of polarization in the high floors. No state represents that more in my head than Florida. Every time you think something's going, all of a sudden you realize, oh, right, polarization. There's an automatic high floor for both parties. Do you see that happening again in Florida this time? You know, the last time I thought there was no way anyone was going to win Florida by more than three points, and, and Donald Trump won Florida by 3.3 percentage points, which in Florida is like a landslide, right? So kind of mm -hmm. all bets are off. Ron DeSantis' poll numbers look very good, and he's gunning to beat uh, President Trump's or former President Trump's margin, uh, perhaps as a way to slingshot mm -hmm. him into 2020 or should he decide to run. And I wouldn't necessarily bet against Ron DeSantis right now. I wouldn't bet for it. It's Florida. Anything can happen. We have had a history of razor-thin election margins. But 2020 really right. kind of put us on the state as a pro-Trump MAGA state. And DeSantis is a real MAGA guy without the baggage that Donald Trump has. Mark Caputo, our man in Florida, uh, when we need him. As always, sir, thank you. Coming up. President Biden ends his meetings with world leaders saying the West will support Ukraine for as long as it takes amid new threats from Russia. Putin's warning to NATO how the U.S. is responding next. Plus, the January 6th committee subpoenas former President Trump's White House counsel. What we know about the possibility of Pat Cipollone testifying. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. President Biden is now on his way back to Washington from the NATO summit in Spain after a couple days in Europe in general. In a news conference before leaving Europe, the president once again reiterated the U.S. support for Ukraine, adding that Washington plans to send uh, $800 million in more military assistance. That money will come from the roughly $40 billion piggy bank, if you will, that Congress gave the president to use for all things Ukraine. The United States is rallying the world to stand with Ukraine. Allies and partners around the globe are making significant contributions. We provided Ukraine with nearly $7 billion in security assistance since I took office. The next few days, we intend to announce more than $800 million more. As I indicated to Putin, this would be his action would cause worldwide response. NATO, meanwhile, is preparing for Russia's potential response to the alliance's pending expansion to include Finland and Sweden right on Russia's border. Yesterday, Vladimir Putin warned that Russia would respond in kind to the deployment of NATO troops or infrastructure to Sweden and Finland, with whom Russia shares a more than 800-mile border. But I'm old enough to remember that if Finland simply applied for NATO membership, there'd be these threats that have been empty so far. I'm joined now by Michael McFall, former U.S. ambassador to Russia and, of course, an ABC News international affairs analyst. And, Mike, let me start with there. Um, this Putin rhetoric is starting to sound so familiar and so empty I, I don't want to underestimate what Putin's capable of, but his NATO rhetoric is starting to come across as a bit stale. It, it, should should I uh, should should I be uh, am I uh, underplaying this? No, Chuck. I think that's a very important insight. Uh, remember all the hawkish uh, language we've heard about NATO forever, not forever, but for the last several years from Putin. Uh, when this idea of Sweden and Finland first joining, uh, the Moscow talking heads were like, this is the end of the world. If you do this, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And then what did they do? Hardly nothing. Now they're talking about, well, if the capabilities in those countries go up in some uh, greater way, then they'll respond. But I think it's an important lesson. 
Uh, we've talked a lot over the months, you and me, and, and, and on TV about mm -hmm. the threat of escalation from Putin. And every time we think there's going to be some big escalatory move, so far, there has not been. So to me, this week was a real test to see how strong is the West going to be with Ukraine between what we saw in uh, the EU plus uh, at NATO. What's your assessment? And, and you know, should I'll be honest, I had some concern that the that inflation, um, the energy embargo was was going to have Europe crack sooner than any of us wanted to see. Well, I had those concerns, too. And I think it's been a pretty fantastic couple of weeks for the West, for mm -hmm. President Biden, because I really think he does deserve credit for bringing this all together. But it started with the EU summit, Chuck, as you pointed out, when they said they're going to welcome. It'll take years and maybe decades. Mm -hmm. But they made the signal that Ukraine should be a European Union member. Uh, the G7 didn't get a lot of attention, but I think they did some important things, both on the infrastructure package but especially on the oil price cap, the energy price cap. Easy to say, hard to implement, but that was a big move. And if it works, I think it'll be historic. And then this summit, I actually think this NATO summit also is historic, bringing in two real powers, biggest expansion, I think, in terms of enhancing the alliance since uh, the, the Big Bang back in 20, 2004, and a lot of other enhancements, mm -hmm. more troops uh, towards uh, the borders, a new uh, headquarters for the United States and Poland, uh, and a lot of unity. There was a lot of unity in all three of these uh, summits. That was not inevitable four or five months ago when this war started. I think well, President Biden gave a lot of credit. So here we have, I think in many ways, Putin has lost this war strategically, I would argue, already because of what's happened with NATO. I think you would argue something similar. But let's talk about Ukraine itself. Um, how do we get Ukraine to a point where essentially Russia cries uncle and wants to sit? Well, before we get to that, I think what you said first needs to be underscored a hundred times because we all jump to the end. How's this war going to end? And we forget how it began when Putin said he was going to unify the what he called Russians with accents, the Ukrainians, because they're not a real people. He failed at that. Denazification, he failed at that. Demilitarization, he failed at that. Taking Kiev, he's failed at that so far. So now he's focused on trying to take Donbass. Uh, and the only way you get a settlement, in my view, is when the Russian army can no longer march forward. Right now, they're still marching yeah. forward. Putin sounds like a, you know, I just listened to his speech at St. Petersburg Economic Forum the other day. He sounds more confident today, Chuck, than he did a month ago. And until they stop the marching forward, there'll be no permissive conditions for a peace settlement. And that means the Ukrainians need more weapons to stop the march of Putin's army. Uh, Putin may attend the G20. Indonesia may invite him. Should we be pre look? Indonesia is one of these countries that's a swing country, arguably between the West, uh, the between the sort of the, the free democratic aligned countries and, and those that want to align with Russia or China. Um, should we pressure Indonesia to uninvite Russia? That's a tough question. Uh, you don't want to try to do things that you lose at in diplomacy. Uh, so I would be afraid that we might lose that battle to try to push them out. Uh, you don't remember, Chuck, but yeah. when I was in the government, the Chinese launched this new bank, this Asian infra Infrastructure and Investment Bank, and we told everybody, don't join, don't join, don't join, and all of our allies joined. Uh, so don't <laughs> pick fights that you can't win. I would say don't pick that fight in particular, but when you get to the G20, yeah. isolate him on the policy issues. Use that forum to show that he is, is more isolated, because right now he's not isolated in the global south. The Chinese are supporting him. The Indians are on the sidelines. The Middle East are on the sidelines. Let's try to use that summit to further isolate him rather than try to kick him out, which I don't think we'll be able to achieve. You know, it's interesting. Where could Russia's economy be come November? You know, are we going to be, I mean, is, is, I guess we have a lot of time to make sure Russia's in a marginalized place. Good point. I think their economy is going to be in a lot worse shape than they are now. They got this big balloon effect with all this new money coming in because they're exporting mm -hmm. uh, oil and gas. 
uh, to the Europeans at really high prices, but eventually the Europeans have taken this incredibly important decision to stop exporting, uh, right. stop importing Russian energy. I think the effects of sanctions are going to be harder in, in the fall than they are today, and we should try to make it harder and harder and harder. In the same way that the Ukrainians need more weapons to stop Putin's army inside Ukraine, I believe the West needs to keep implementing new sanctions to right. keep squeezing the economy. Ambassador Mike McFall, uh, always good to get your perspective on this, and I always learn something when you're on. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Up next, President Biden pushes Congress to codify Roe. Congresswoman Cheney slams Trump in a new speech at the Reagan Library, and the January 6th committee calls for new testimony from the president's former White House counsel. What it all means politically, next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We've got plenty of new developments in what has been a pretty big week for the January 6th committee. Following Wednesday's bombshell testimony from former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson, the committee has now subpoenaed officially former White House counsel Pat Cipollone. Hutchinson told the committee that, among other revelations, Cipollone was warning White House officials about legal implications of Trump's efforts to go to the Capitol and his refusal to quell rioters. Plus, we know they were even nervous about the speech he was prepared to give in the ellipse, and then he gave it anyway. And just hours after the committee announced that subpoena, the vice chair of that committee, Liz Cheney, spoke at the Reagan Presidential Library about Hutchinson's willingness to come forward while criticizing other Trump staffers who have not. Her superiors, men many years older, a number of them are hiding behind executive privilege, anonymity, and intimidation. But her bravery and her patriotism yesterday were awesome to behold. Joined now by President and CEO of Voto Latino, Maria Teresa Kumar. She's also an MSNBC contributor and Republican strategist, Doug Hyde. Doug, let me start with you. You know, there are a lot of stories about the, a lot of Democrats apparently went to the Reagan Library for the very first time last night uh, to hear Liz Cheney speak. But um, she is painting in brighter colors on this issue than anybody else. Uh, I think she views... She views Donald Trump, she said it, as not a threat to the democracy. And I think she believes the Republican Party cannot survive unless Donald Trump essentially has a stake driven through his heart. What kind of constituency can she end up having when all of this is done? Well, it obviously depends on if she can win or, or not in her primary. She has a debate tonight. So, you know, the stakes have already been high. They're higher than they've ever been. But clearly what she's doing is also not just politics. Uh, but standing for, for principle and the things that, you know, you, when you take your um, oath of office as a, as a member of Congress, um, that, that you take very seriously, and obviously she does. What that means politically, it means she's got a very tough race. Um, and she has a tough race of her own doing. Um, and we have to see what, what she'll be able to do ultimately. But she's raised a lot of money. She does have a lot of support. We'll just see if it's enough in, in Wyoming come primary day. Maria Teresa, you've got your ear to the ground um, for because of what you do full time for a living. Are the January 6th hearings, are you hearing about it when you talked uh, on the grassroots when it comes to Voto Latino? What's interesting is that the testimony that we just got had from Ms. Hutchinson is the one that seems to be resonating the most. That and the mm -hmm. election worker for Moss, where she was feeling personally threatened, those two are the mm -hmm. ones that have stood out because. I think their stories are so personal and so identifiable for the community that we're tar targeting, disproportionately young people who want government to work. I do think, though, that a lot of the inside baseball, a lot of the details, a lot of what uh, Liz Cheney is trying to break mm -hmm. through has not been as distilled as is necessary. And these are conversations that I've had uh, right. with the White House, is that there needs to be a strategy to demonstrate to the American people that it's not just inflation that's on the ballot. It's not just whether or not we're recovering yeah. from an economic, you know, economic slump. It's also, are we going to safeguard our democracy in November by ensuring that there is more of a status quo and delivering to the president a government that still believes that they should be acting in the will of the people? I think that what has resonated the most right now among the population, not shocking, is actually this idea that Roe versus Wade has been banned in so many states as a result of mm -hmm. the Supreme 
And they are starting to see the erosion of rights in real right. time, not just through January 6th, but coupling it with what we're seeing of coming out of the Supreme Court. You know, Maria Teresa, you and I are both sort of, uh, you you're, you uh, grew up in Latin America. I grew up in Miami. We're both sort of, we, we're, we're junkies for our Latin American politics, too. And when well, I, I heard her describe what Trump wanted, <laughs> what Trump wanted to do, <laughs> what Trump wanted to do, he he came across like some dictator from Latin America that we saw over the years, that he wanted to march up to the national. Is that a picture you can paint for in some Latino communities to sort of shake them out of this a little bit when it comes to Trump. In so many ways, yeah. So just for clarification, I grew up in Sonoma. I came here when I was three, but I've always had a foot in two worlds because so many of my family came from Colombia. And I, what you're illustrating is absolutely right. right. I do not have to get, it was it was interesting, right around January 6th, when all of that happened, I would get into a cab and talk to cabbies in in. Uh, in DC and tell them what was happening and ask their response. They're like, well, that's what we fled. Yet many individuals, yeah. as it was yeah. unfolding, people did not believe in the quarters of Washington power that that was possible in this country. But you hit mm -hmm. the nail on the head. The reason that we have so many immigrant communities from all over the world is because of the dysfunction of the, of the governments that they mm -hmm. left. This smells to them as something that's highly corrupt, smells mm -hmm. to them of a banana republic, smells to them of autocracy, and smells of them autocracy under the guise of democracy. And so it's important for us not only to make those connections, but also remind people that the reason they left was because under that corruption, yeah. only the people that are in favor of whatever the government's will is, whether they're oligarchs or otherwise, are the ones that actually get to enjoy the spoils. And nothing is more of a tax on business and on free liberty and thought than autocracy. Yeah. And yeah. that's clearly what the Trump uh, yeah. Trump wanted to do. Doug High, it seems as if the one way these January 6 hearings are having some impact on Republicans is simply it distracts Trump, right? He can't help himself. He's getting involved in a primary and a state house race in Arizona, right, for vengeance. He's actually willing to sit on an airplane for nine hours for vengeance in Alaska. He's so... It's sort of one of those things I, I buy when Republican strategists tell me, hey, January 6th isn't having an impact on the election, except it is having an impact on Trump's behavior. Is that a problem for Republicans for the next six months? Um, no, I don't think ultimately it is. And, and maybe in a longer term, a better thing for Republicans. You know, we're, we're still going to be more focused as voters on, you know, all of the issues that, that when we see polling says that are the number one, two, three concerns for voters, starting with inflation, obviously rising crime, you know, being that Donald Trump will be the distracting sideshow, not great for Republicans, but he's starting to give Republicans both the voters and the politicians, and by the way, also the donors, uh, a reason to inch away from them. And as they do, inch by inch, we may not see it every day, but ultimately we're seeing a party right. that is starting to separate from Donald Trump because of what we're hearing in these hearings and because of his reaction. Speaking of separation, I got I'm curious, Maria Teresa, you probably heard our first segment about we're starting to see Democrats poll numbers are improving. Joe Biden's aren't. There seems to have been a bit of a decoupling here, at least for the midterms. What do you make of it? I think it's people understanding that a lot of the, the folks that are currently in the state legislature are responsible for the abortion ban. They are the ones that are responsible for the, I don't know if you know, if you saw today, but Texas decided, the Texas school board decide, is, you know, considering whether or not to change the word enslavement to uh, involuntary relocation. It's that kind of extremism that doesn't sit well with the majority of Americans, whether it's rewriting history or taking away a woman's agency. And the list goes on. I often say when people say, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to participate in the midterms, it's like, well, you sort of know how the Republicans are going to legislate based on what we're seeing in Florida. And that includes right. basically taking a woman's right to choose. That includes basically banning books. That includes, uh, you know, racial theory. That includes weaponizing people because they believe that everybody should be armed. And right. if you take them for their word, is that the kind of state that you want to live and raise your children? And, and resoundingly, people are saying no. And Doug, real quick. I know the Republicans want to run against Biden, but I'm curious. I, I sense the same thing Anna Greenberg did. It isn't he doesn't he doesn't provide enough anger for people to get fired up about. And I think you guys have noticed that in your own fundraising. I mean, we've, we've noticed it in fundraising, but 
In 2010 at the RNC, our magic number for Obama was 46. We felt if it was at or below that, we'd take back the House. Biden is well below that with a majority of Republicans and Democrats, obviously independents as well, saying we're on the wrong track. That spells electoral doom. In a normal time, it does. I just wonder in the age of polarization. I, you know, I don't know if there's anything as a big, big swing these days. Marie Teresa Kumar, Doug High, uh, great, smart conversation with the both of you. Thank you. Coming up, speaking of the Supreme Court, boy, they keep figuring out ways to end with a bigger and bigger bang. What do you hear? What's next? You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Boy, has it been an historic uh, week or two weeks or term for the Supreme Court. Uh, today was another historic day. Katanji Brown Jackson officially being sworn in as the newest justice, first black woman to serve on the high court. She succeeds Stephen Breyer, who hired her as a clerk more than 20 years ago. We also learned today a bit about one of the high profile cases, Jackson, uh, and the court will hear next term. The court agreed to decide whether state legislatures, not state courts, have the final authority on deciding how elections are conducted, a case that could have far-reaching implications for how influential partisan state lawmakers could be in future elections. This also could impact redistricting in a lot of places as well, independent redistricting commissions, you name it. The case won't be heard, though, until the fall and, of course, the decision uh, sometime in 23. Also today, in one of its most consequential environmental decisions in years, the court essentially gutted the EPA. They limited the tools that the Environmental Protection Agency can use to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. It's a gigantic setback in the Biden administration's efforts to combat climate change. But the idea that the government has no role in this, or very little role, is a huge setback, perhaps for the next 30 years. But in a victory for the administration, um, although one that comes with political complications, the court ruled that the White House acted properly in its effort to end the Trump administration's so-called Remain in Mexico policy. Uh, the conservatives there, two of them siding with the three locals. I'm joined now by Pete Williams, who, of course, covers the Supreme Court for NBC News. Also with me is Nate Persily. He's a professor at Stanford Law School, former senior research director for the Presidential Commission on Election Administration. So, Pete, let me just start with you on sort of the big stories here. Uh, the Biden administration gets a victory, but it's probably a, one that comes with more political headaches for them. We could deal with that later. But there seemed to be a rationale behind it that wasn't necessarily one that, that maybe the Biden administration should see as some sort of new pro-immigrant court. Explain. Yeah, th this was a very technical administrative case about whether the Justice Department dotted all the I's and crossed the T's and trying to shut the program down. And basically, the Supreme Court said, yes, so far, so good. Have at it. It goes back to the lower courts now. Uh, it's, it's more than just administering last rights for the program. There's still some legal questions involved. But, but basically, the, the Biden administration can continue trying to shut it down. This did not get into the guts of the, of the problem here, of course, which is that the law okay. says, on the one hand, Anybody that comes into the country, while they wait to, for their immigration hearings, you must detain them. And if you can't detain them, then what? And the government says, well, we'll release them and they can show up for their hearings. A judge in Texas said, no, you have no choice but to send them back to Mexico. So the, the Biden administration can continue trying to, to fight that. All right, let's move to the case they took for next term that's going to uh, is certainly... Uh, make people like Nick personally uh, work a lot harder over the next few months. Pete, lay, set the stage. Set the, what the case is about what specifically? Well, it's about redistricting in North Carolina and whether the Republican plan, which was overturned by the state courts, can survive. The, the question is this. Who gets the last word when there's an election dispute? Is it the state legislature or the state courts? To illustrate why this is so important, think back to the last presidential election, when the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said, yes, you can count votes that come in after the deadline, uh, mail-in votes, as long as they arrive before Friday at a certain time, because it, while the legislature exp uh, gave a cutoff time, the, the state Supreme Court said, we interpret the state's constitution to say you've got to give as much benefit as you can to allow voters to vote. So this is called the independent legislature theory it's something that's pushed by republicans who say no the constitution says that states choose the time place and manner for elections and so forth so they get the last word so i think another way to think of this is 
what is the legislature? Does it write the rules for the election and then it sits back mm -hmm. and lets the courts work it out? Or is, is the legislature like the referee that's still on the, goal, on the sidelines? It, that, it, there's a lot at stake here because if the Supreme Court says legislatures can override, in a sense, state courts, then where do voters go if they feel their rights are being abused? Nate, uh, explain why folks are losing their mind about this, particularly on the left. Well, this has implications for presidential elections, for congressional elections, for redistricting, for absentee balloting, for essentially the whole federal electoral system. And that's because, as Pete was saying, uh, it's possible that you're taking every question of state law, which we ordinarily think of as being adjudicated by state courts, and you're now potentially throwing it into the federal courts and then ultimately at the Supreme Court. So all of these questions that we've been debating over the last few years about electoral slates, about whether a state went too far in absentee balloting, and then, of course, the constitutionality of redistricting commissions, all of that could potentially be at the uh, uh, footsteps of the Supreme Court uh, if they believe this theory. And, and let me, just to give you a sense of how radical this potentially is, if you unmoor the state legislature from a state constitution, not only does that mean that the state court is not going to be able to check it, but what about the governor? Mm -hmm. What about the attorney general? What about the legislate, the, um, the, the secretaries of state and the local election officials, let alone the people through the initiative process? If you really believe that the state legislature is independent, then they're really going to have the final word on all of these questions. Nate, what are they... What there's always a thread of something that this is being hung on, this sort of independent state legislature mindset. I mean, is it an overreading of one part of the Constitution that someone's obsessed over? Well, you know, it's funny because this all goes all the way back to Bush versus Gore. Uh, that was the first time that in the mm -hmm. 2000 election that we sort of heard of this theory uh, when the one of the arguments was the Florida Supreme Court went too far and effectively was putting itself in the position of a legislature. Now, look, they've got constitutional language uh, in the article. Article one, section four says uh, each state legislature shall determine in time, place and manner of congressional elections. And so the, the response, and it's a kind of typical textualist argument, is to say, look, why did they say legislature in the Constitution instead of just saying state, as they do so many other places in the Constitution? So it's not you know, a crazy textualist argument, but it has huge implications and would really sort of overturn the apple cart of election law. Pete, they took this case. It means four justices thought there was a, at least four, correct? Would they have taken yes. it if they didn't have a fifth vote? Well, yeah. probably not. I mean, you de generally speaking, you don't want to grant a case if you think you're going to lose it just for the, 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 you know, just to have a spirited argument. There's usually some internal strategizing. We know that there were three justices who feel quite strongly about this, uh, a fourth, Justice Kavanaugh, who seems interested in it, too, and they must think that yeah. they have a fifth vote here or they wouldn't have d agreed to grant the case. They you can't be sure, but they must think they're going to win. I have no idea how law professors are supposed to teach constitutional law anymore. Anyway, uh, Pete Williams, Nate Persley, uh, thank you for helping us unpack this one. Up next, Democratic Congressman Vicente Gonzalez joins me next on why he believes his party is, quote, taking Latinos in South Texas for granted. What should be done about it? We're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Every election can tell us more about where the electorate may be shifting. 2020 was no different when candidate Joe Biden narrowly won Texas's Rio Grande Valley region, despite Hillary Clinton winning the same region by double digits just four years earlier. Concerns from Texas Democrats escalated this month as they watched Republicans pour a bunch of money into a South Texas special election, while Democrats decided to prioritize other races. Why? Because the district was disappearing. That was the rationale. But the result was a bit of an embarrassment for Democrats. Republican Mara Flores was able to flip a seat that was once considered reliably blue. And though the seat will, as I said, be essentially disappear in November, Texas Democrats are urging party leaders, hello, this was a warning sign. Pay some attention to the Latino vote and course correct before it's too late. Question is, is it too late? I'm joined now by one of those lawmakers, Texas Congressman Vicente Gonzalez. Congressman, it's good to see you. Look, you are not happy with how the DCCC handled this. Was, do you believe this was a singular bad decision, or do you worry this is 
more about they don't understand the problem uh, that Democrats are having with Latinos. And it is not just South Texas. I'm a South Floridian. Um, we're seeing it in New Mexico. We're seeing it in Arizona. But uh, what's your take? Well, clearly Latinos are different across the nation. And, and uh, South Texas is a special place uh, with a traditionally democratic, conservative democratic uh, population that's been uh, democratic for over 100 years. And there's no reason why we should be losing elections here. But we do need to be countering the Republican narrative. I mean, when you have a gun-toting, QAnon-pushing, election-denying candidate win an election, even though it was with less than 1%, with less than 1% and less than 15,000 votes, you know that more could be done to prevent that. And it's just about taking the region seriously, making the commitments and investments that are necessary to talk to this community in the way that they need to be talked to. It's not, it's not Los Angeles. It's not New York. It's not even Miami. It's South Texas. And we yeah. are uh, a region that, of people that have been here for generations. Most of uh, the people here didn't cross the borders. The borders crossed them. They're moderate by nature. Most of them are Catholic. But we're yeah. Democrats because the Democratic Party has represented us. And we want to continue this way. And we're going to is continue though, to work. And we're going to win in this, November. Is this a Washington problem or an Austin problem? And the, what I mean is, you know, I look at the Texas Democratic Party and talk question. about punching below your We talk about punching above your weight. You know, I'm sorry. There, there's, there's certainly a floor of about 45 percent on a bad day for Texas Democrats. But the state party acts as if it's Idaho. Yeah. So the state party lacks resources at the state level. And that's why I've been sounding the alarm in Washington to the DNC and to the D-Trip that, hey, we need help down here. We need help down here to keep our seats blue. To, we need to counter the message. A few years ago, after the 2020 election, there was a, a, a pretty good um, research study group that talked to people. We, we talked to hundreds of people. And one of the conclusions that, were, that we came up with was that um, during the 20 election and a little bit before that, there, it was a one-way conversation. Republicans were pouring uh, heavy resources into the area, and we weren't able to respond. In the city of McAllen, Texas, and Laredo, Texas, and San Antonio, Texas, we now have community centers being opened by the Republican Party that, you know, it's like going to the Boys and Girls Club, and they're recruiting 13 and 14 and 15-year-olds, and it's really just a, a brainwashing machine that we need to counter, and we need to have a counter message. The, the, the Democratic Party is the party of equality. It's the party that has given Latinos in South Texas an opportunity to an education. It's a party that gave our seniors Social Security that gave us a 40 hour work week that continue to take care of our minimum wage to make sure they're living wages. The Democratic Party represents our values more than anyone else. We just need to be in front of it and we need to be communicating. If we're asleep at the will and the other side is carrying the narrative, then mm -hmm. we're in trouble. And there's no reason for that. We just need the we need to have the political will both in Washington and in Austin to make the infrastructure investments in the region to assure that our area continues to stay blue and eventually turn the entire state blue. There seems to be two issues in particular that the Democrats have just seemed to not figure out how to talk to Latinos about. I'm curious your take, which is crime in, in specifically uh, and, um, and education, right? Where education, where there's a lot of Latinos who don't mind charter schools and, and are open to, to different ideas and things like this, and that sometimes runs counter there. Uh, is it what is there ways to fix those issues in particular, or is it just sort of a do Democrats need to be better educated about well, what Latino voters care about? Absolutely. And, and also, these issues are regional. They may be different here than in Los Angeles, than in, than in Austin or Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. And we need to start looking at things regionally. We need to start studying uh, people's ideas from a regional standpoint. Uh, we're talking about Latinos on the border in South Texas, kind of rural, a rural region. Uh, and, and you have to have different talking points. You have to know what's bothering people in this area and how we can improve people's lives. And we've done it for over a century. Uh, we've improved people's lives. We've educated uh, a whole generation. People are doing so much better in South Texas today than they were a generation or two ago. And it is because of democratic values. But we can't stop talking about it. Democrats do the most and brag the least. And that's our problem. That's one of the problems in our country that we right now, uh, President Biden has accomplished so much. We have uh, one of the lowest unemployment rates in generations. We have 
We have uh, infrastructure projects coming up across the country. We need to be out at every infrastructure project that has given people clean water and drainage and better housing and better education. And we need to be bragging about it because that is exactly what Republicans do. In fact, in some areas, they're bragging about projects that we funded and that we created. And we need to be vigilant of this and we need to be expressive and we need to be communicating with the American people and with Latino communi communities such as in South Texas. Congressman Vicente Gonzalez, uh, Democrat from uh, Texas. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective with us. Good to talk with you. Thank you. Good to talk to you. And thank you all for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now, NBC News Now coverage. Continues with Tom Costello, who's sitting in for Hallie Jackson and starts right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.